apologies for the lateness of this episode um, due to some recent uh, site developments. I had to kind of revise my shooting schedule a little bit and my original character select episode that I had planned for this month ended up getting pushed back a little bit for me to work on it a little bit more. Believe me, when I get to that episode, you'll understand why I took more time to kind of get that particular subject matter correct. But I didn't want to break my once a month commitment to this series, so I began scrambling for a replacement subject for character select. And thankfully, due to the recent disappointment of a certain big summer blockbuster, I was able to come up with something, and life, as today's subject matter would put it, found a way. My appreciation for Dr. Ian Malcolm has certainly increased with age. Back before the first Jurassic Park was released, I prepared for that cinematic moment by familiarizing myself with the original Michael Crichton novel. While it definitely primed me for Steven Spielberg's summer dino extravaganza, I'll admit that a lot of the characterization from the book didn't leave much of a lasting impression with me. For instance, in the novel, Alan Grant was a very stock protagonist with very few character flaws and who was perfectly fine with kids. Ellie Sattler was relegated to the background as his accompanying grad student. John Hammond was more of a cold and emotionally detached bureaucrat than a whimsically naive visionary. And Ian Malcolm, while retaining his role of being the voice of reason in the story, had his eccentricity somewhat limited on the written page. He was still the naysayer and prophesied the inevitable system collapse of Jurassic Park through chaos theory and fractals but it certainly came off more as an avatar the author utilized to channel his moral through, rather than a fully realized character. And despite being absolutely right about everything, he died. Until he didn't. Uh, the lost world in any medium is sort of a mess. Needless to say, when the first film came around, Malcolm's character required some much needed... What's, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> Goldblum. He required some much needed Goldblum. That is now officially both a name and a noun. This is where the character of Ian Malcolm first truly came alive for me. Sure, the dinosaurs were a visual masterpiece, but Jeff Goldblum as the rebellious mathematician. Chaotician. Chaotician, actually. Sorry, chaostician is where humanity truly shines in the film. And that's no slight against anyone else's performance. Truly, this movie is an acting tour de force. It has to sell you on the idea that these people are witnessing living, breathing dinosaurs for the first time ever in human history. It's... it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. They're moving in herds. They do move in herds. They do it. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. But it's Goldblum playing the world's most entertaining wet blanket that makes the stakes in the movie all the more vital and important. Sure, at first Malcolm is drawn in by all of the wonder and awe that the park can muster, for about all of five seconds. If anything, that makes him double down on his beliefs that this is a monumentally bad idea, which it is. <laughs> and how do you know they can't breathe? Well, because all the animals in Jurassic Park are female. Oh. We've engineered them that way. How do you know they're all female? Or somebody yeah. go out in the park and pull up the dinosaur skirts? All vertebrate embryos are inherently female anyway. They just require an extra hormone given at the right developmental stage to make them male. But we simply deny them that. Listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously, but... Uh, well, there it is. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? No, I'm, I'm simply saying that life uh, finds a way. He's the only mouse in this maze that sees the trap for what it is, despite the enticing piece of Gouda just laying there in front of him. The skepticism of other characters like Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler kinda comes and goes depending on the Spielbergian whimsy of the moment. One second, Ellie will be on Hammond's case about having poisonous plants in the hotel. The next, aww, my big girl Triceratops is sick with the tummy rumbles. 
Heck, Grant is practically getting off on watching the raptors eat their prey, and the next scene he's like, uh, I, I could go either way on this, I guess. Malcolm's the only person on this little weekend getaway that sees the woods for the trees. And in any other movie, that would make him the unbearable know-it-all that makes you want to see him get eaten by a T-Rex in five seconds flat. But, yeah, he's just so entertaining. Yes, for all intended purposes, Malcolm is the movie's resident buzzkill. What, we'll have a, a coupon day or something. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, the lack of humility before nature that's being displayed here um, staggers me. Yes, he is constantly using quips and snide remarks to verbally dismantle Hammond's justifications for building this park. Uh, now, now, eventually, you do plan to have dinosaurs on your on your dinosaur tour, right? I really hate that man. Yes, he tests the patience of almost everyone else in the group. By the way, Dr. Sattler, um, she's not like available, is she? Why? Yeah, I'm sorry. You two are, uh, yeah. Yes, he has a somewhat overinflated ego with regards to his brilliance. Boy, I hate being right all the time. But god damn it, he is charming. His remarks can be unbelievably eloquent, striking, and funny all at once. Joan, inherent uh, in what you're doing here, genetic power is the most awesome force the planet's ever seen, but you wield it like a, a kid that's found his dad's gun. His demeanor may be that of a cautious and calculating skeptic, but that doesn't mean he's a total jerk-ass devoid of sympathy for others. He sacrifices himself for Alan and the kids, for God's sake. Where's the cold, logical reasoning behind that one, Ian? Ian. Remind me to thank John for a lovely weekend. And he's not such a social pariah that numbers and fractals are all that matter to him. This chaos -tician has got game. Or at least he thinks he does. Comment below if that little water on the hand experiment ever scored you somebody's number. Because I will call you a liar flat out because only Jeff Goldblum's Malcolm would be able to pull that off without getting slapped in the face. This character and this performance left such an impact with viewers that for a while afterwards, that's all people could see poor Jeff Goldblum playing in movies. Hey, could you play Ian Malcolm but, you know, with an albino? Hey, could you play Ian Malcolm but, you know, in space? Hey, could you play Ian Malcolm but, you know, with creepy CGI cats and dogs? Hey, could you play Ian Malcolm but, you know, in space? Again? AGAIN? And to really mess with your headcanon, try making a double feature out of both Jurassic Park and David Cronenberg's The Fly. Now do you see why this guy is so cautious about untested science? And the less said about Malcolm's appearances in the rest of the Jurassic franchise, the better. He definitely became less enjoyable in the Lost World, and was he even in Fallen Kingdom? I was too busy checking my watch, sorry. I think that Malcolm's reasoning in the first film can certainly stand as a critique of the franchise as a whole. You stood on the shoulders of geniuses uh, to accomplish something as fast as you could, and before you even knew what you had, you, you patented it and packaged it and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and now we're selling it, we're selling it well. Malcolm essentially tries to warn everyone of the perils involved in taking something that should be perceived as rare or special and attempting to homogenize or duplicate it. Our scientists have done things which nobody's ever done before. Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. That's the moral of the first film, but ultimately a great statement on the franchise overall. The first Jurassic Park is still something special to me. It's one of those movies. The made me fall in love with movies movies. But Hollywood's constant need to replicate its success in subsequent films has led to significant holes in the original genetic code. Oh, they try to fill in the gaps with new material they think will be interesting. But life always seems to find a way of not making that pan out for them. But regardless of all that, we'll always have Ian Malcolm as the flag bearer for everything we adored about that first movie. I think I'll have that on the tour. And 25 years later, the franchise's most beloved character has the most perfect line that can pretty much sum up the state of things for the Jurassic franchise right now. 
That is one big pile of shit. Oh, I know, such a predictable joke, but yet still funny. That's, that's chaos, dude. 